So uh, good morning, uh, Mrs. Chinavra Boato, and thank you for granting us uh, the opportunity, you know, for uh, to, you know to see your restoration site here at the very top of Mount uh, Makai here in Siem Reap uh, Province. So, uh, Mrs. Chinavra Boato, you have been, you know, uh, heading the project of the restoration here for more than 12 years. You know, the restoration started since 2004. So, um, my first question is that, you know, because in Siem Reap, there are many, many restoration sites handled by many nationalities and also sometimes, uh, you know, private enterprises. So, for this uh, temple in particular, why you know, the U.S. or uh, the World Monument Fund decided to restore this temple in the first place, ma'am. Yeah, well, thank you, first of all, for coming to Phnom Bakain and giving me the honor of this uh, interview. Um, I would say that this is not just a decision from the World Monuments Fund or the U.S. government. Uh, this is more of a concerted decision with our mm. local partner, the Absaran National Authority. So I think from the side of World Monuments Fund, there has been a uh, so, as you said, before 2004, yep. uh, an interest to be engaged with the restoration of another temple uh, and with new challenges also compared to other projects we had been working on. And we have discussed about ideas of what we could do and the uh, new skills we could bring into the country mm -hmm. with the Absar Authority, who pointed out that a number of temples where we could uh, get these tested. So Phnom Bakain was among these uh, choices, and that's how we, we got to work here. But uh, pre previously, you also worked, you know, on the restoration of the Saum and Prakhan. Oh. So were, were those temples like, you know, the first, you know, crawling stage in order to, to restore something as big as Bakain? Correct, that is correct. Yeah. So the first conservation project from where Monuments Fund was launched in 1992, and that was a Khan. Mm. And the idea was to work on a temple on of a larger dimension. So as a Khan eventually is, it's one of the largest in the Ankara civilization. Um, and also the idea was to test also how we would restore a ruin uh, mm. within an environmental and a forested context. Uh, then, with the years, I think, yeah, 1999 or 2000, we started also Tassan. But the idea was to uh, target a very small temple where our team of uh, conservators could, you know, test themselves as a, mm. in, in a leading role, so with less and less international supervision. But uh, normally, ma'am, you know, because um, restoration is uh, more like, um, you know, a work based on, you know, trial and error and learning. As well, so yeah. normally, you know, you learn all the way from the Saum to Prakhan, you know, the technique you develop all the way along the way, right? Yes, correct. It's not like you have a rule book and then you understand all, no. Well, you know, we have, uh, there is the conservation science, of mm -hmm. course, and then there is the uh, more the philosophical aspect, uh, mm. which, you know, it's really an, an ad hoc approach that is developed for every single uh, project differently. Uh, I would say that we learn a lot probably uh, with Priyakan, we develop certain methodologies, which mm -hmm. then we continue applying and probably we adjust it, yeah, I would say over time. What, what is from, practical, yeah. Exactly, yeah. exactly, exactly, to the actual needs. I, I'm just I'm just thinking of an example, which is, uh, you know, as you know, we work also at the training of the Seelman Gallery at Angkor Wat, uh, and we saw that it was, uh, the, you know, in the, in the gallery roof, it was very mm. important to, uh, to keep the uh, natural uh, the passive drainage uh, channels uh, uh, in a good conditions uh, for every block. Uh, so we learned that, you know, maintaining the a good pitch, a good uh, water management was important. Management, yeah, water yeah, management. Water yeah. management. And this is something that we brought in also to Phnom Bakai. So every terrace, basically, we are reinstating uh, mm. um, similar pitch to what was originally put in place already by the constructors so which is a two three percent and it's you know it may sound as a small detail but it's a key detail yes ma'am but uh, you know back to the you know the restoration of uh, number kind yes i mean you know we are seeing here much of them are restored already you know the terraces they are in you know very good alignment but you know it wasn't a lot like this uh, several decades ago or maybe you know during the french uh, you know protectorate so um Normally, uh, when you first come here, or maybe in 2004, how damaged was Makain Temple, ma'am? And, you know, what is the common issue? Of course, uh, the water, you know, 
uh, intrusion, but you know, is there anything other common issue on Bakai? But certainly, uh, I would say that the first uh, issues we have, uh, we've observed and actually partly still visible in the areas mm -hmm. that are yet left uh, unrestored, that we will restore in the coming years. Uh, well, collapse of the wall, especially at the corners. Because you mm -hmm. have to know that, uh, I think, uh, especially in other corners, you will see uh, very heavy uh, stone shrines were built uh, exactly on the uh, on the edge of the of each of the four corners at every terrace. And you know this brought in uh, additional load to those uh, locations. Mm -hmm. uh, and in this way, you know it. It, the corners are already structurally weaker than perimeter walls, so this additional load uh, brought to the to the collapse of the corners. Then yep. we had, uh, uh, yeah, uh, so this brought also to a loss of, uh, of blocks, uh, dispersion of blocks around the site, and then we had also uh, vegetation, so trees and plants growing in, and of course. Uh, uh, displacement of blocks uh, of the pavers uh, and uh, which led the way as you mentioned to water yeah. intrusion but yes ma'am like you know just to dig a bit deeper into the technicality but you know why why is the corner more susceptible to damage because is it like the load will concentrate on that corner well this is a it, it is a, it is a fact okay. <laughs> that there is an accumulation of the deterioration forces uh, at mm. the at, at corners so in modern construction you would eventually strengthen additionally the corners mm. which is something that we're also doing in today's conservation work yeah. but the fact that very heavy stone shrines were located exactly on top of the corners this brought an additional load and stress to that location so that's what brought to collapse and that's why you can observe that most of the corners, especially at the lower levels, have lost uh, their stone shrines. So when the corners fell down, they will pull the surrounding stone. Yes, with yeah, yeah. The everything. Also. Yeah, went with them. Yeah. Mm. But, you know, in, in general, like, uh, you know, in 2004, you know, I mean, how much of, uh, you know, like a percentage that is done, you know, damage on the temple, let's say, like, is it very ruined? Or, well, all the know? corners were collapsed. All the, of, Some yeah. worse than others, but all the corners uh, for uh, four, four tiers from the bottom, mm. they were all completely uh, collapsed. Collapsed. So, as I said, the blocks were concentrated on along the corners or they were on the on the bottom in some cases they were completely gone mm, yes ma'am and now you know the corner is very clean and you know i think more reinforcement are, are being done to to all and and all, also the towers of the temple also but you know the, the following question ma'am um, you know for let's say restoration capacity you know the human resource and especially the time needed to restore each monument for example this one I think it's 20 years already. Huh, yeah. So before coming you know, to the restoration, what do you need to do? Let's say, what kind of data you need to collect or you know, human resource from Cambodia, the US or other countries? I mean, how do this logistical, how do you overcome this logis logistical challenge, ma'am? So let's say if we want, if, if, if I can re reply to your question in a way that I address both components of the human resources and the data to be collected, I would say that uh, uh, you know, possibly uh, one would always want to look for uh, resources that are already in the country mm. because that's, uh, you know, at the end, I mean, we're an international yeah. organization and we are here, we've been here for some time, but, you know, with the future, maybe at some point we will change the way we work with the Absar Authority and the Cambodian government. So it's always our priority to work with the existing local uh, uh, capacities, absolutely. Uh, and in some cases, of course, we, uh, w when it's needed, then we bring in uh, international specialists. Mm. So in the case of Phnom Bac I, uh, so yeah, as you mentioned, the studies began in 2004 until the 2007. Uh, there was a, well, a general assessment 
the first step. Oh, so there were no physical activity? No, uh, no, the no. physical activity started at the end of 2008. Mm, yeah, I see, yeah. I see. So during the assessment uh, missions or studies, uh, we, uh, we look into the, the history and interpretation of the site, archaeological investigations. So, you know, you always start from what is the history of the site, uh, mm. what happened to the site uh, since it was built, uh, uh, why are there the, for example, when you look around, you can see blocks that have been disposed as a, as to make a fences, as to make a, a barriers. Why are these blocks in this condition? You need to understand mm. all the layers of the history of the monument. So that took three you years just to uh, review all yeah, yeah, of yeah, the yeah, ruins. Yeah yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So it's a lot of bibliographical research. Uh, and uh, also interviewing other experts. Mm. Uh, this is one thing, and then there is the physical assessment of the site. So the assessment of the quality of the of the stones and any material that is involved. So you mentioned sandstone, laterite, and the, the bedrock, so the rock of the um, of the mountain, mm -hmm. of the hill. Uh, there is a there is a structural assessment on the condition of the temple. There is a documentation, an assessment of how water eventually is being mm. managed or not. By, it, by the monument, how the water flows, where it goes, uh, is it creating areas where the water pools, and so mm. on. So, for example, if you want to see how the water flows, you have to wait until the rainy season. For example. In order to see the reality of how the water protrudes yeah. each stone. But how about the tree you know, surrounding? Yeah. Because it is also part of the uh, you know, heritage uh, let's yeah. say element. Yeah, for a number of reasons also because, you know, as we've seen, uh, we see at every uh, rainy season in particular, mm -hmm. especially at the uh, in September, I would say is the idea of time. That's the time where you see also there is a lot of, there are a lot of trees that, mm -hmm. uh, that fall to the ground and bring, uh, you know, the, 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 yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. They make uh, walls fall and so on and they can be very dangerous. So. Um, I would say also there is also an assessment of the condition of the temp of the, the trees surrounding the temp. I see, man. But you know, I, I heard from you know some of the specialists. They say that in order for a restoration to be conducted, they need at least three kind of uh, you know skill. Let's mm -hmm. say skill you know personnel. One of them is the architect, yeah. the engineer, and the historian. So that is what they said. But you know, for you, in order for this restoration to you know to proceed smoothly, uh, how many you know specialists do you normally normally need? I think that's a very good uh, yeah. uh, information that you were given. Yeah. yeah, we have an engineer, an archaeologist, and an architect. So how do they intertwine when when working? Well, you know. Whatever decision is to be taken needs to be observed, uh, look at, looked into from different perspectives. So there is the perspective of the structural engineer, there is perspective of the architect, and then mm. the archaeologist. So do we want, to, is this wall, can we keep the wall the way it is? Well, the structural engineer might say, okay, we need to dismantle it because uh, it doesn't look yeah. as stable. And the archaeologist might say, well, you know, we, we want to keep the authenticity. Let's yeah, keep yeah, it yeah. the way it is, you know. <laughs> so, so how, and the how... architect needs to yeah. be able to mediate, you know. Mm. Yeah, I would say the architect is probably the most important figure, and professional figure and skill in this in this kind of uh, projects. And um, yeah, and you know, he or she needs to be able to keep the balance between uh, the engineer perspective mm. and the archaeologist or historian perspective. But you know, you mentioned that you know there are water protrusion and there are yeah. three so botanist. Hydrologist or you yeah. know, 3D modeler, something like that, also. Yeah, but these, you know, these uh. skills do not need to be 24/7 available. You know, oh, you can okay. also hire very specialist, uh, very special skills, uh, mm -hmm. say on a consultant base, so they don't mm -hmm. have to be around the site the whole time, but just uh, uh, in certain moments, yeah, when it's needed. Yes, ma'am. And you know, on the following question, you know, because um, temples are a place of worship, first mm -hmm. of all. It is a tourism hotspot. You know, it is also a historical place, a heritage place. So it has many function. It has many function in one. So how do you normally, you know, how do you balance between, you know, traditional technique and modern technique? For example, at the corner, I see in your, you know, uh, data, you put some, let's say, waterproofing screen or something like that. So how do you balance between, okay, this is modern and it's good, but this is traditional, but it is also good. 
in order okay. to retain the authenticity? Okay, that's a, that's a good question. It has yeah. two important components. One, you mentioned about the different functions of the yeah. temple. I would say, I would even use another word, which is a value, which is mm. domlai in Khmer, which means uh, uh, a site, as the whole Angkor site and each monument can serve different uh, purposes, as yeah. you said. So, well, that's a, that's a big, uh, that's a challenge, you know. It's difficult to be able to maintain the different, to respect the different values. And you can see that this is also, you know, this is something that Apsa is very dedicated to as well, because in some cases, some areas, for instance, of Bayonne, have been closed to mm, tourists so that yeah. believers can continue uh, their, uh, their rituals. So, um, yeah, it's, it's not easy. I don't think there is a one approach that fits all temples and all people. Um, I would say that uh, for me personally and for us, we feel like uh, uh, respecting the religious and the cultural uh, values of the site are quite important. Uh, respecting as well the, uh, um, the safety of the site, accessibility for tourists, for tourists. Certainly, that is also another value. And you, another question you mentioned about the use of modern and traditional yep, yep. materials. Well, every conservation project uh, needs to find that fine spot. You yeah, know? That, that is that, a very, very small gap in, in, the, exactly. in the tool. Yes, yeah. I would say that for the most, we try to follow, we want to follow as much as possible the traditional materials. And mm. as you can see, when you look at the, you know, behind us, the conservation project that has already come to conclusion, this yeah. specific uh, corner, and you, it's hard for you to see modern materials. Yeah, We've yeah. used them, as you mentioned, waterproofing membrane, lead flashing, uh, stainless steel rock poles. They are inside, mm -hmm. but they're not visible. So the outside are normally older stones, you know, the stone yes. from the, yeah. the you know, let's say, pre-restoration era, something like that. Yeah, or yeah. it can also be new stone. New stone also. But it's the same kind of stone. It's the mm. same sandstone that was used in the past, of course, from another quarry. The other thing is, Sometimes, uh, let's say, you need to think that if you keep using exactly 100% the same technique, the same mm. materials in the past, uh, you will get again to the same situation, to the I same see. deterioration, okay? Uh, however, if you introduce modern materials to a certain extent yeah. and within certain limits, uh, you can strengthen. Make the, it longer. Yes, yeah. yes, extend the life of the restoration yeah. and, of course, of the monument as well. I see. So, for example, what they are doing over there is, uh, you know, partly, let's say, traditional because I see some of them compacting the earth yeah, by yeah. hand. But at the same time, you know, modern equipment are, are needed yes. to use also. Modern, you know, using modern equipment <coughs> is different than using modern material. It's two different mm, things. Yeah, yeah. For so, example, the power machine, yeah, we need to, we exactly, need to use it because it exactly. saves time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. saves time. Uh, yeah, and you see we have, uh, we have two tower cranes. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we use the power tools, as you mentioned. Um, and specifically for the restoration of the staircase, of the sudden staircase, mm -hmm. which uh, should be completed within a month. <coughs> so in the coming weeks. Uh, really, the, the idea, what, what we're doing is a stabilization. So it means mm. where we see that blocks have been displaced, but they are displaced from their original position, or they are on the verge of collapse, so we dismantle them. We look at the foundation, we transfer the foundations, and then mm. we reassemble them back. So it's quite simple, yeah. I would say. And it's, you know, one other element that is always important to keep in mind is stone naturally ages everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We Especially age. sandstone. Yeah. Sandstone, they can break down, they can flake down very they easily. Can, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. But it's quite, if you think about it, it's over a thousand years. So mm. it's quite remarkable. Uh, as in some cases, it's very, in very good condition. So, um, so you know, if uh, a block of sandstone is decayed uh, beyond uh, use, mm -hmm. then we replace it with a new one. But, but we the try same, not the to same, do it as much yeah. as possible. Yeah, yeah. same material. But yes, ma'am. You know, uh, one of the main, you know, entrance viewpoint of Makai is, of course, the eastern entrance. Correct. And yeah. for me, uh, you know, until I am, you know, this age, 
I climbed that stairs only once <laughs> when yeah. I was three years old. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I've never, you know, got a chance to climb it again. So, you know, it has been closed for a very long time. Right. I think for nearly 20 years or maybe more uh, than that. It must be at least 15, 20, 15, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so so uh, just a, you know, normal question, like why don't, you know, the, the restorers restore the entrance first? Yeah, that is a good question. Um, I think at the time that this temple, was, the, the conservation project, this temple was started, everybody felt that this was, everybody agreed. Mm -hmm. So it's not just where monuments fund, but you know, uh, absent national authority as well. We all agreed with uh, prioritizing the, the pyramid, so mm. the central temple. And I, I believe also that you know, the conditions of, of the lateral staircase came to yes, such sir. serious conditions uh, ju just afterwards. Uh, at current, where Monuments Fund does not have a, a plan, an immediate plan for intervening on the, the lateral staircase, uh, we have developed some preliminary assessment uh, and, you know, projected expenses for a potential mm. project. Uh, and should the APSER authority be interested in doing this, we would be most happy to, to help as, yeah. as we can. Yeah. But for now, the stairs remain what they are today. Yes, yeah. for the moment, yes, yes, yes. Yes, ma'am. But you know, Bakhain has, um, I don't, I don't call it an issue, but you know, like, um, you know, let's say uh, something that we need to think about is the tourist uh, concentration. Correct. And it has been said for many, you know, many years already that, you know, the tourists, each of their step can, you know, microscopically chip away the stone <laughs> layer, something like that. So every evening or every morning, you know, depending on the, on the season, many people come and sit on the stone, walk on the stone, uh, sometimes thousands of people at the same time. So from your, you know, technical or structural point of view, do you, I mean, how, how damaged is, you know, the, the tourists on you know, their, their interference on the temple, let's say. Yeah, that's a good question because we, uh, so in 2011, I think we got to, to the situation, <laughs> to a very mm. serious situation where there were even more than a thousand people. At in the one same time. time. Yeah, 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 yeah. Or, you know, just the queuing to go up. And I think that's what brought War Monuments Fund at that time to uh, organize a visitor management workshop with the Upsar Authority, Ministry of Tourism and UNESCO in New York to discuss this eventually very serious issue because the temples are, this temple, Phnom Bakhain, is very fragile. And I think one of the reasons why it remained uh, with us for such a long time is that mm. not so many people were, you know, visiting it. Uh, and um, the idea was really to uh, find a way to reduce uh, the load of mm. the, all the visitors. That's why we agreed on introducing uh, a limit an upper limit to the number of visitors who could be at Phnom Bakhain at the same time on the but, top. But technically, do you really see, you know, uh, the visible damage done by the tourists, you know, over time, let's say? Well, when you mentioned the cheap, yeah. microscopically chipping, yeah. I don't think we can see that uh, yeah, in, in, a, in, yeah. in a very short time, but over yes. a, a long time. But, we, but we have seen, uh, mm. I would say um, 15 years ago or so, we would observe uh, blocks just the rolling off uh, being displaced mm. by people there so you know there are specific uh, carrying capacity studies uh, which tell us how many people should at most be in a certain place and that's why we agreed to uh, we conducted these studies and without our authority we agreed to limit this to 300 people at one time yes at one time yeah and yes ma'am you know a bit of a technical question also because number kind you know, its foundation, of course, it has laterite stone, sandstone, and some compact earth. But at the same time, it is built on top of a mountain bedrock. So because it is built on that, you know, very strong, let's say, mountain element, uh, does it naturally, you know, strengthen the temple structure, you know, let's say, compared to uh, Mayuan that does not have, you know, a mountain bedrock? underneath let's say right um well i think for sure it's it's a good point it's a good mm. element structurally structurally to have uh, the Something the better strong, foundation yeah, yeah. yeah because it's a it's a one piece eventually mm. the foundations are the foundation of number kind is just the one piece of uh, of bedrock and it's in continuity with the rest of the hill uh so 
I think, you know, for sure there is erosion, uh, for sure there have been a displacement also of the portions of the bedrock, mm -hmm. but I would say it's a quite a, quite a strong uh, uh, stone. So it's, um, I, I, think, I think it's just, a, it's, it, it's a plus, it's a good thing, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Um, but how about, you know, for example, when I look at the temple of Phnom Krom, you know, because, because it is on top of the mountain mm -hmm. and, you know, a lot of elements are facing, you know, the temple, for example, the winds, of course, are higher. The sun can be a lot, uh, you know, yeah. stronger also. And Phnom Krom, you know, the way I look at, you know, the tower, they are very, very eroded. Mm -hmm. Some of the sculptures, they are gone, actually. So is it, uh, you know, something that, you know, restorers should, you know, pay more attention on on the temple, especially if they are on the mountain, because they get more intense, you know, elemental intensity, let's say. Well, it, de it depends. Uh, mm. I think it depends on which other we're talking about, because mm. they are, you know, it, it, it depends to what they are exposed. So not mm. necessarily because it's on top of a hill. I would not say that that is a They a can be eroded faster. Yeah. No, no, not, yeah, not yeah. necessarily like that. I wouldn't that. say that. I wouldn't yeah. say that, yeah. And maybe also, uh, maybe the last question also, um, you, uh, a bit of a philosophical question also. <laughs> uh, temples, uh, they break down all the time, you know, you fix it here and then they break mm -hmm. over there and then over time, you know, the element will knock them down. So when you talk about restoration, do you think it is simply an endless job? And, you know, people of the next generation, they have to, you know, to bear this, uh, you know, uh, effort. Well, you know, I guess in a way it's not differently than uh, it's not different than having your own house to mm. look after, <laughs> look, yeah. and it's not different than mm. having taking care of your body. Of course, you know it's a. I would not say an endless job, but you need to keep looking at it. You need to keep monitoring it. Yes, mm. I would say monitoring is the key word here. So, yes, one day we will be done with the restoration project. And I think what then needs to happen is monitoring. So just you know, coming frequently at uh, uh, some given times over the course, over the year and looking at okay, are, are the blocks in this and that location are they moving? Mm -hmm. Can we observe any uh, any location where water is pooling and it might bring uh, additional material damage to the underlying stone? Uh, you know. When you leave, when you come, when you are done with the restoration project, you also leave a kind of a <laughs> recommendation list mm. for the next caretaker. Yes, uh, you know of what they are supposed to do in order to continue keeping a good care of it. So, the monitoring, of course, take take years, but it will give out the recommendation, you know, yeah. guideline yes, for yeah. future restoration. Yes, the, let's say yeah. the recommendation are mostly about the monitoring. Mm. So keep keep taking a look at it, keep looking at its condition and how it's, uh, the temple is changing and, uh, you know, being ready to intervene whenever something serious or not comes up. Yes, ma'am. And of course, after the Prakan, after the Saum and after Bakain, you know, do, does the World Monument Fund have other projects in Siem Reap, let's say? Yes. Maybe, so, maybe bigger temple or three <laughs> <laughs> So yeah. at the moment, uh, you know, at the, at the beginning of 2024, we have uh, officially uh, brought to completion our conservation project at the Saum, tuning of the mm. Seal Mill Gallery at Angkor Wat and Priya Khan. Uh, so we're currently focused only on the restoration of Phnom uh, We envision at least five more years. Five probably. more years. Yes. Mm to complete it, uh, more or less. Um, and I think, uh, I think honoring this commitment is, uh, for us is very important. And uh, we will see how over the years, if the opportunity comes to uh, you know, find uh, uh, new ways or continue mm -hmm. being uh, uh, engaged with the Absar Authority and Cambodian government and uh, you know, find new projects or just uh, change the way in which we work and, uh, do other kind of uh, projects together.